We're continuing in our Jesus series. I know some here have not been part of that. But it's, it's easy to follow, so. Today we're talking about Jesus helps us in everyday trials, specifically on rejoicing in trials. And many of us Christians and non-Christians alike don't really understand or we're surprised or puzzled by the combination of trials and rejoicing. But suffering and rejoicing go together. So how is it possible for us to have joy during suffering? So let's look and see what God wants us to know about trials and being joyful during them. And so we're going to start out with the book of James. And James is a powerhouse of wisdom and answers to the common questions that we have. And trials are important for our future eternity. And James is very strong in this. So I'm going to start out with James 1, uh, verses 2 through 7 and 12 through 15. And hopefully they'll get up there in a minute so that you don't have to scramble to write. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. In verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So James talks a lot about what to do and what not to do. So now let's go through each verse and examine what he's saying. In verse 2, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. I read that, pure joy. He doesn't say joy. He says pure joy. So me, the OCD in me, wants to know what pure joy is. So I looked it up. It's the genuine emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying, keen pleasure or elation. What? When was the last time that you felt pure joy while going through a trial? But wait, why do we have pure joy? Steady persistence. Sorry, in verse 3, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So what is perseverance? Steady persistence in a course of action, a purpose, a state, especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, and discouragement. So why is perseverance important? Because James says it makes us mature and complete, not lacking anything. Isn't that our major goal as a Christian? Won't perseverance from one trial help us during future trials? In verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. He doesn't say it might be given to you. He says it will be given to you. This is a sure thing. God will give you wisdom. He loves to give you wisdom. Remember, Solomon asked for wisdom, and God was really pleased when Solomon asked for wisdom, and he was considered to be one of the wisest men who ever lived. So James talks about trials, and then he talks about wisdom. So to me, that's telling me, walk in the wisdom that God has given you, 
maybe some of the trials that you go through could be prevented. In verse 6 and 7, it says, When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because if we doubt, we shouldn't expect to receive what God is going to give us. So we know God never lies. His word is truth. Do you ask for wisdom when you're going through a trial? I don't ask often enough, but I do ask for it. Because I don't want to make my life harder than it has to be. Some trials we can't help. They're not brought on by us. They're caused by people around us or caused by things in the world. But I want to prevent those trials that I could cause myself by walking in the wisdom that God has given me. In verse 13, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted. Here comes the best part in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I don't know about you, but I really want that crown of life. So let's move to James chapter 5, verses 7 and 11, 7 through 11. And it's talking about patience in suffering. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The thing that struck me when I was reading the book of James is that every time he refers to trials and suffering, he immediately talks about the good that God brings from it. Have you noticed that? So with trials, there's always encouragement. We know there'll be trials, but God wants us to always keep in mind that there are blessings in the end. And there's a couple of biblical examples of trials, and specifically Job. I'm sure we all remember the story of Job. Everything was taken from him. He was a very wealthy man, had a great family, and everything was taken from him. He had boils all over his body, and he sat in ashes. He had friends coming by, some trying to encourage him, some really discouraging him. And he writes in the opening chapter, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he even rejoiced during that trial. He had to deal with accusatory friends. His friends came by, and even his wife told him to curse God, but he did not. He maintained his trust and his faithfulness in God. And when his trial was finished, God restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. You know, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first part. He gave him 10 more children, and he lived for 140 years. But Job is an example of standing firm in a trial. And look at Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers. He was sold into slavery, thrown into a pit that he couldn't get out of, left. Then he works his way into a home of Potiphar and his wife. She thrust him on her, you know, she, he thrust, she thrust herself on him, and he wound up in prison. So just when he was, things were starting to go good, he gets thrown into prison. And then God gave him the gift of understanding dreams. So he answered a dream of the king, and the man was supposed to speak up for him, 
and the man never did, so he stayed in jail for two more years. So Joseph, the whole time, was doing what God wanted him to do. He was walking in faithfulness. But still, these opportunities kept going by. But when he was released from prison, he became second only to the king. And he made preparations for the famine that was to come, and thereby saving many people and saving his family. And he rescued his brothers who treated him so badly. And at the end of his life, Joseph said to his brothers who had horribly mistreated him, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So Joseph, he trusted in the promises of God. He found joy in the trial. He knew that God had a plan for his life. And he endured those difficulties because of his faith in God's word. So James has given us a lot of encouragement regarding trials. Let's move on to see what Peter says. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Even so, we can rejoice. Why? Verse 9. You are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we rejoice in the salvation that we're already receiving through faith. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Again, notice that like James, Peter states that we'll have trials, but in the next breath encourages us. And that hope that he gives us is Jesus. So do we truly believe and operate on what the Bible says? God's word is truth. He cannot lie. Let's move to Romans 5. And these verses really get me excited. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. I love this. This is just a powerhouse of help and encouragement. We know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance is important in this life to withstand the trials. And then perseverance produces that godly character in us. And that character produces hope. With hope, we can do all things. Hope is a big word. God has given us hope in all of our trials and sufferings. And we have to remember that when we're going through trials. I know some of us are going through some really, really tough trials. But our hope is Jesus. We have to keep our faith in God and have that joy of knowing God is with us in this life every step of the way. He's walking with us in trials. And we also have that hope of eternal salvation, happiness, being with God and each other for all of eternity. That's where we should be getting our encouragement from when we're going through those tough times. In verse 5, 
in the voice. This is how it words it. And hope will never fail to satisfy our deepest need because the Holy Spirit that was given to us has flooded our hearts with God's love. I like that. Don't those words just jump out and grab your heart? In Romans 8, 17 through 18, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's very powerful. Do you ever stop and just really meditate on that statement? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And in verse 28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how he will not, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Verse 28. That's a verse that I try to always remember when I'm going through a trial. All things work for the good of those who love him and who have been called, and we've been called. This is, this is the most exciting part for me. For, I think this is one of the most encouraging scriptures in the Bible. Verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It says God loves us this much, and he loves us in the trials. We need to remember, we talked in our earlier sermons, and I know some weren't uh, here to hear that, but we were talking about that God has a plan for each one of us. And his plan is to prosper us, not to harm us. Remember, we were discussing Abraham and the promises made to Abraham. and. Why is it so hard for us to believe that we're different than Abraham? God made promises to Abraham, and he fulfilled them. Why wouldn't he fulfill those for us as well? God had a specific plan for Abraham. And there were times when Abraham went off on his own, like when he told the kings that Sarah was his sister, that got him in trouble. But God went along. God covered that. God had a plan. Abraham didn't thwart that plan. wasn't what God wanted, but God still worked with it. And that's kind of the way trials are. Sometimes there's no right answer. There's no right action, but God walks with us in it. And look at King David. King David is a good example. He had a man murdered because he lusted after a woman. And then his son, his baby, died because of it. And David was really distraught. But after that, God says that David was a man after his own heart. You know, that's, that's an amazing turnaround. But David repented and looked at what God did with him. God, God worked with David because David had a positive attitude. Why don't we walk in optimism in a positive attitude when we're going through a trial? That's one thing that I believe the Holy Spirit's really been working with me on, is when I'm going through a trial, I'm learning to relax. God's in control. Whatever happens, whether I like it or not, it will be good for me. And sometimes that can be tough to accept that. But sometimes our positive attitude affects those around us. It can change a trial around for us and for others. We have to hang in there believing that God will deliver us. I've made my mind up to cling to God for dear life no matter what. 
He is the only one who can save me. I liken it to a child who grabs onto his father's leg and his father can't move and he's clinging for dear life. That's how I feel we should be towards God, just clinging to him every day for dear life. So while we're not promised a life without trials and testing, God has promised to walk with us during those times. When we walk in the Spirit, we can be positive every day, but it's a choice that we have to consciously make. Are we going to listen to those around us who are negative? Or are we going to believe in God and His promises that are sure things? So walk in the wisdom and understanding that you have, always asking God for increase. We might be able to prevent some of the trials that we take ourselves through, and I know that's true for me. <laughs> so choose to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. And the Spirit will teach you how to be obedient. But we must have a willing heart, and we must want to be obedient. But the most wonderful good news is Jesus has fought the battle, and he's won for us. Our sins are covered. He's with us. And before closing, I'd like to share a little bit from Mark Batterson's book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. I really encourage all of you to read it. It's just been an awesome thing for me. Encouragement in trials and looking at trials differently instead of looking at them as something bad is an opportunity. And in his chapter four, it's on reframing how we look at trials. And he talks about the story of starting his church in Washington, D.C. called the National Community Church. And in the beginning, it was really, really small. He was discouraged. He said he didn't even want to be the minister there. <laughs> and then it, it rolled along with not many members and just kind of depressing to him. And then they found out where they were meeting was in a public school, and it was about to be closed because of fire hazards. So he looked at that as something that wasn't very positive. And this is what he says. But what he first saw as a daunting problem turned out to be an amazing opportunity. So they started exploring rental options in Washington, D.C. And there was only one door that was open to them, and that was the movie theater at Union Station. And Union Station is the most visited destination in Washington, D.C. More than 25 million people pass through there every year. They have 40, 40, uh, 40 food court restaurants, and it's four blocks from the largest homeless shelter in Washington, D.C. And this is, this is what he says. I love this. God perfectly positioned us right in the middle of the marketplace, and we wouldn't want it to be anywhere else. But here's the thing. It took a setback to get us where God wanted us to go. It took a God-ordained opportunity that came as a really well-disguised problem. And that, that's really encouraging to me because I'm starting to look at problems that arise in my life and look at them as an opportunity. I, want, I pray about these opportunities and ask God, this doesn't seem good, but I know you can make it good. And that just have that trust and that faith. That's what God wants us to do. So, you know, Mark Batterson's telling us sometimes some of the biggest problems turn out to be the biggest opportunities. And he quotes in this chapter C.S. Lewis in his book Letters to Malcolm, and I thought this was really good too, about how to rethink our prayers. If God had granted all the silly prayers I've made in my life, where would I be now? Lewis went so far as to say that someday we'll be more grateful for our prayers that didn't get answered than the ones that did. The reason for this is simple. Many of our prayers are misguided. We pray for comfort instead of character. We pray for an easy way out instead of the strength to make it through. We pray for no pain when the result is no gain. We pray that God will keep us out of pits and away from lions. But if God answered our prayer, it would rob us of our greatest opportunities. And this really stood out to me. Maybe we should stop asking God to get us out of difficult circumstances and start asking Him what He wants us to get out 
of these difficult circumstances. I think that's really, that book is really encouraging. I just recommend that you read it. I'm on chapter, I've read through eight chapters, and it's really changing the way I look at trials, no matter how much they hurt. I know God's with me, and he'll make it good. He'll turn it into something good. And I have that deep faith that God has given me, and he can give it to all of us. I just believe that so much. So in closing, Jesus said, If you want to follow me, take up your cross. Be willing to suffer, even to lose your life, if you want to follow me. So our Christian life, it does involve suffering, and we shouldn't be surprised when it happens. Jesus said that a servant is not greater than the master. If Jesus, our Lord and teacher, became a human to suffer and to die for us, if suffering was part of his training, it's going to be a part of ours as well, and we shouldn't be surprised at it. But the but, big B-U-T, in these trials is that we can rejoice because we know that Christ has promised us something far better. In James 1.12, he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Remember those words. You are saved. Rejoice in the fact that the creator of the universe loves you, has a plan for you, and he's so able to carry out that plan. I like to think when our physical life ends, we will stand before Jesus and he will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. So I hope this has been encouraging to you, the things the Holy Spirit is teaching me. I am doing my best to walk in them, and it's made a big difference in my life. I'm a happy person every day. Do not allow negativity to come in. Every problem is an opportunity for growth and learning. So I'd like to leave you with this benediction. And this is Romans 15, 13 in the words of Paul. And I've actually looked it up in three different versions of the Bible because they're all pretty unique and encouraging. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's in the NIV. In the message it says, Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that your believing lives filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit will brim over with hope. And the last one in the Amplified, May the God of hope fill you with all peace and all joy in believing through the experience of your faith, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will abound in hope and overflow with confidence in his promises. And we speak that over you.